Hello, it's good to have you with us today. We're especially excited for the children that are joining with us. Kids, we love you at the Edmund Church of Christ. Has anybody ever called you a stinker? I've been called that, and it's usually when I'm doing something that I probably should not. Kent, you're being a little stinker. I don't think it meant that I hadn't taken a bath. Now, I hope you take baths, and we take baths because we want to smell good and we want to be clean. There's a lot of things that we do to smell good. It, we take a bath. Some people put on perf perfume or, or even cologne. But it doesn't take a bath or perfume or cologne to make us smell good to God because the way God smells other people is a little bit different. Listen to this verse from Ephesians 5.2. Live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a sweet-smelling offering and sacrifice to God. When we live lives of love, that is very pleasant to God. It means we smell good. It's like we smell like a rose or maybe like a, a cookie that's just been baked. That smells good to God when we do things for others, when we love like Christ. And Christ gave himself for other people. So when we do good things for others, that smells good to God. God's sense of smell is different than ours. Doing good things smells good to him. And so we can smell like roses to God. He will smell us and see our actions, and he'll smile. God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. Hello, Edmund Church family and friends all over the world joining us today. Thanks for tuning in. We've said it before, but let me say it again. The body of Christ, the church, is not limited to a location. It's not bound by a building or a certain time of the week. The body of Christ is active throughout the world. It's not so much where we are as it is who we are and who we are in the world. And speaking of our world, things lately in our world seem pretty discouraging. More than that, troubling. The events in Minneapolis and Georgia and other places truly break our heart. And it makes us, among other things, long for heaven a place and an existence where there won't be racism and there won't be violence and there won't be anything that is outside the will and the ways and the heart of God. We're going to say more about that later. But as we think about how it makes us long for heaven, we should also be reminded that as ambassadors of Christ, as members and citizens of the kingdom of heaven, our job is to help bring heaven to earth. If we pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then we need to be instruments of the answer to that prayer and bring heaven to earth. And so maybe it's a wake-up call for many of us. The truth is, all people reflect the image of God and are valued by God and are close to the heart of God. And I want you to know today that that's true for you, that God values you, that God loves you, and as we worship today, we are reminded that worship is a response to who God is and what he's done and what he continues to do. And so as you join us, as we join together in worship today, let's respond to the goodness, the glory, and the grace of God. Let me call your attention to Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2. You might want to read this out loud with me. Psalm 103, verse 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Let's worship together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing your 
Our scripture reading this morning will be from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We're thankful for the time that we have uh, to stop at the beginning of our week and spend time worshiping you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. Father, we know that right now there are so many things going on in our lives and in the world around us that are out of our control. Uh, Father, in our prayers that you will help us to be people who each day decide to put our hope and our trust in you to allow your spirit to work in our lives and open up our hearts uh, to the plan that you have for us. Father, I pray that you'll be with our church leaders, our elders, and our ministry staff. I can continue to give them wisdom and strength. Father, we're excited about the opportunity of coming back together as a church family, but we know uh, that that also presents challenges. And so we pray that you will give all of us patience, and Father, just a spirit of unity will move through your body here at Edmond. Father, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, the example that he is to us, our prayers that you will help us to be people who see and love others the way that he did. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Shadows 
Many Christian authors have written about finding God in ordinary moments and in ordinary people. All throughout scripture, we see ordinary individuals being called by God to do extraordinary things and show his extraordinary compassion and his love. Especially now with limited places to go and things to do, we must be able to find God in the little ways we interact with others and online. It was Jesus that was sent to look like an ordinary man to express the radical love that God has for you and for me on the cross. Through him, we have the miraculous resurrection that gives us hope even in the darkest of times or in the moments that we feel most alone and isolated. It is this love and sacrifice that we worship and that encourages us to do the same and for others. And we had this written uh, specifically in 1 John 3, 16 through 18, about how this love encourages us to do the same for our community and our people as we imitate this Savior. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth.
Father, with what seems like an ordinary meal and ordinary bread, we'd like to celebrate your awesome son, Jesus Christ, and his awesome works in our history that changes everything for us. God, we ask that you take us as a church, a group of ordinary people, and remind us and transform us to be your body and your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. O oh Lord, with the symbol of your blood, we ask that you wash us clean. We witness injustice. We see our ourselves and others argue and disagree about how to go about things in uncertain times. We ask that you take this from us, that you make us a community that is not about our differences, but more about the love that we have for you and your creation. This is our greatest and truest label. Conform us and transform us to be people that imitate you and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's now time for our offering. And even with a thing like a financial contribution or our time spent with others can seem like an ordinary or a normal thing. As we think about being stewards of the gifts that God gives us, I think of how we can be intentional about these gifts and about this time that we can spend with others and for others. I ask that we think about how we can be intentional with the resources and the time that we have and how we can praise God and glorify God with these. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for being uh, a God that's on mission, that even in these ordinary things, even in a time like now, Father, that we see your fingerprints and the way that you move in all areas of our life. Father, help us to take uh, advantage of these times, to, to see you in these places and in these people, and to be that for others as well. Father, thank you so much for partnering with us or allowing us to be part of your mission in our world, especially one where we do see darkness and where we do see uh, people being isolated and alone. Uh, Father, I want to thank you so much for giving us the opportunity, us the resources that we can praise you and give back to you as you've given so richly to us and for us on our behalf. Father, it's, it's in your son's name that not only we pray, but we act together as a church and as a community for your glory. Amen.
Disrupted. In this series of messages, we are looking at people and passages in the Bible to see how they responded when their lives were disrupted, when their plans were changed. And we want to learn how we, as disciples of Christ, can respond in faith when the same thing happens to us, because life is filled with interruptions. And sometimes these interruptions are caused by God. God sends them our way, and sometimes they aren't. But in all disruptions, in all interruptions in life, God can use those disruptions to make disciples. And that's what we want to be. We want to be disciples, faithful disciples of Christ. You know, with disruption, there comes opportunity. Disruptions in our lives, they don't have to, to derail our lives. They don't have to destroy our faith. In fact, in the midst of interruption, when our plans change, when things don't go as we expect or want them to, that's the moment when we can open our eyes and see what God is doing, see what God is up to, and maybe submit our plans to him and join him in what he's doing. I'm sure you have heard stories recently about creation seeming to, to wake up with everyone going inside. It seems that with the home quarantine that wildlife began to sort of roam around in places they hadn't been before, at least for a long time that you could see things that couldn't be seen before because of less smog and pollution and some of those things because people's routines were changed. People changed what they did. Their lives were disrupted. And in the midst of that disruption, new life seemed to emerge. At least it was visible on many fronts. Maybe one of the best examples of that is in Venice, Italy. I, I mentioned something like this in a devotional thought that I emailed out a few weeks ago. Whereas other cities have streets and roads, Venice, of course, is famous for its matrix of waterways and canals throughout the city. And in those canals, there are, as you can imagine, or if you've been, you've seen, all kinds of boats. The famous gondolas that are meandering up and down the canals. There's also um, service boats and water taxis, all kinds of, of boats that normally go up and down those waterways. Well, during the quarantine, when the city pretty much shut down, boat traffic virtually stopped. Pedestri pedestrian traffic basically came to a standstill. And there was a calmness over the city. And when that happened, the water that is always stirred up began to become clear because the, the dirt, the debris began to settle at the bottom. And so the water became clear. And when the water became clear, you could see wildlife. You could see fish and jellyfish in the water. Swans began to come back, and swans were seen in the canals there in Venice. It was like a complete transformation. You know, sometimes disruptions help us see the dirt. And sometimes we need to see the dirt. And sometimes it takes disruption for us to see the dirt. That was certainly the case for the children of Israel in the Old Testament. If you know the story, you know that God delivered his chosen nation, Israel, out of Egyptian slavery and oppression. That through the, the ten plagues, maybe you're familiar with the ten plagues, that he brought his people out of slavery. Pharaoh, who was the leader of Egypt, was finally tired of being plagued by God. He was tired of the frogs and the flies and the gnats and even worse plagues. And so he finally let God's people go. And God brought them out of Egypt, but God wasn't just delivering them from something. He was delivering them to something. He had a special future for them, a special home for them. It's called the promised land because God had promised or had a covenant with Israel, his people, that he would make them a great nation and that he would give them a great home, a land of their own. This land of promise was called Canaan. And the plan was 
to go into Canaan to inhabit the promised land. But their trip got interrupted, a journey that some people say should have taken about two weeks by foot, took over 40 years. That's quite a disruption. That's quite a detour, isn't it? You know, sometimes when we take trips, things happen, right? Cars break down, tires go flat, people get sick, plans change, lanes get blocked, roads get closed, things happen. So often when we travel, we use a little map app on our phone. Even if we know how to get to the destination, so we sometimes use the map app because we want to see if there are any accidents or if there are any, uh, anything going on that we may need to take an alternate route. And of course, that app shows us that. Well, for Israel, their turn into the wilderness or turn back into the wilderness wasn't a shortcut. It wasn't an alternate route. It was a road closed sign put there by God. It was a major disruption in the journey. It was a major interruption to their plans. So here's how it all went down. We read about it in Numbers chapter 13. If you have a Bible, you might want to look there with us. Numbers 13, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. And so Moses sends 12 spies or scouts from Israel into this land of promise, into Canaan. They are to explore, maybe take some samples to bring back. They are to assess the situation, see if there is opposition in the land, just sort of get the lay of the land. And so the spies or the scouts, they are there for 40 days. And they finally come back after 40 days. And the text says they bring some of the, the fresh produce back with them. And the, the produce is so impressive. They, they bring it on a pole between two men carrying it. It's, it's clusters of grapes and it's pomegranates and figs. And I can remember as a kid going to Bible class, the pictures of this always impressed me because the grapes were like the size of watermelons. And I thought, man, our, our store doesn't have grapes like that. Where do, where do you find grapes like that? I don't know if the grapes were that huge, but the cluster was big and it was impressive. And they bring it back. And when they bring it back, they report on what they saw in the land, in Canaan. And 10 of the 12 spies talk about how rich and fertile the land is. It's flowing with milk and honey. But there's more to their report. But in that land that's flowing with milk and honey, there are powerful people. There are fortified cities. There are obstacles in the way. Even giants, giants like Goliath, would be from this tribe, this Anak tribe that seems to be there in Canaan. There's all kinds of opposition there. Now think about this for a minute. Everything in Israel's story, everything in their past had led them to this moment. They were on the threshold of going into the promised land. They were on the brink of blessing from God. And God had been with them all the way. He had delivered them in a miraculous way out of Egyptian slavery. All the plagues, all the miracles. He had traveled with them and led them and protected them along the way. He opened up the Red Sea. There was no mistake that God was with them. He provided for them. He protected them. He led them. Why would God leave them now? Why, when they are on the brink of their inheritance from God? this promised land of God. Why now would they doubt? Why now would God not be with them? Well, one of the scouts knew all of that. One of the scouts named Caleb, he interrupts all this glass half empty rhetoric from the other spies, at least 10 of the other spies, and he has his own report. Verse 30, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. And you know by we, Caleb means we as in us with God, God with us. We can do this. God has been with us the whole time. But Caleb's confidence was not echoed by many of the others. And so they step up and amp up their game as to the opposition in the land. Verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. 
And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. You know, so often when we want a different future, we tend to rewrite the past or the present. We see it sometimes in relationships. Someone wants to get out of a relationship, they began to rewrite the nature of the relationship and the history of the relationship. And they began to talk about how bad things are and how bad things have been for quite some time. And you see, when you tell a story like that, it begins to convince you and you hope it will convince others that it will justify the future that you want that is different. We call it revisionist history. That's what Israel seems to be doing here. They talk about the land and the people in the land and the fortified cities in the land. And much like we do when we use revisionist history, there seems to be some exaggeration here. In fact, they almost use like mythological terms to talk about the land devouring its inhabitants or these giants that are in the land. And we are like grasshoppers compared to everyone there. It got so bad that they decided it would be better if they chose another leader, did a U-turn, and went back to the wilderness and back to Egypt, where they were slaves, where they were being oppressed. That's how their vision had been blurred on the brink of Canaan, the promised land. Back in our text, Numbers 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Well, Moses and the couple of people who are faithful to God and know that they can take the land, they are in anguish. They tear their clothes. They are so discouraged. And then they double down on the assurance that God is with us. This is no time to turn around. This is no time to change plans. This is not the time to doubt. In essence, what they're saying is something that we need to hear. And that is a future in an unknown place with God is always better, always better than turning around and trying to live without God. But they weren't very convincing. In fact, the people want to stone them. They want to kill them because they feel so strongly that they have to turn around. They want to follow someone else. God had been with them the whole time. Moses had been with them the whole time. God's instrument, God's leader. And yet here they are, ready to choose someone else, ready to go back. Well, to say that God was disappointed in their response is quite the understatement. In fact, God was really ready to unleash the fury of his judgment on his people. But Moses talks to God. And much like he did after the golden calf incident at Sinai, Moses appeals to God. And specifically, the text says that Moses appeals to the steadfast love of God. The Hebrew word is hesed. It's this undying nature of God's commitment and love to his people. Moses knew that God would be loyal to his promises and loving to his people. In fact, Moses quotes God himself talking about himself. Verse 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. You know, the Apostle Paul would later write in Romans, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. But sometimes love and discipline go hand in hand. Ask any parent of a young child, and they will tell you that that's the case. And so we must read the rest of verse 18. You see, the rest of verse 18 says, Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Yes, God forgave Israel. Remarkably, God forgave Israel. But that doesn't mean there weren't consequences. Being forgiven doesn't necessarily remove the implications of our actions. It doesn't necessarily wipe away all the consequences. If I 
steal $20 from you, you may forgive me, but you're probably not going to put me in charge of your finances. You're probably not even going to let me keep an eye on your wallet or, or something like that, right? Because things have changed because of what I did. And so in one of those puzzling paradoxes of God's mercy and God's judgment, we see God forgive Israel and allow them to go into the land of promise, even though they doubted, even though their fear caused them to want to turn around and go back. He allowed them to enter into Canaan, the promised land, but not until they took a little detour, a 40-year detour into the wilderness, where a whole generation of disobedient doubters would find death. Back in the text, chapter 14 of Numbers, verse 20. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them, as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, no one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. And that's exactly what happened. None of that generation, except for those few faithful ones, those faithful spies who said, yes, we can do this. None of them saw the promised land. You see, their journey to the promised land was interrupted by their sin. That's what happened here. Their journey was interrupted by their sin. Their detour was a direct result of their prideful rebellion. They were exiled back into the wilderness. But really what happened is God just allowed them to go where they wanted to go. God gave them over to their desires, to the path that they chose. Remember what they said? It would be better for us to go back to the wilderness, to go back to Egypt. In fact, they said it would be better if we died in the wilderness. Well, guess what happens? God gives them what they ask for. As we consider this story in our biblical text and its implications for our lives, how we handle disruptions, what do we do when our lives are, are seemingly turned upside down, when our schedules and routines are changed, what do we do? How do we respond in faith? One thing we need to see very clearly is that life in the wilderness can be difficult. No one likes to live in the wilderness. Maybe visit the wilderness on occasion, but you don't want to live there because there is discomfort there. Life is not easy in the wilderness. And so if you take the time to read the rest of chapter 14 of Numbers, you will see God describing life for Israel as they wander in the wilderness. And the word suffering is used many times. You see, life in the wilderness can be difficult. Several years ago, someone published several written complaints that came in at the ranger station at the Bridger Wilderness Area in Wyoming near Yellowstone. People enjoyed the picturesque wilderness and the trails and hiking, and then when they came back, they filled out comment cards. Here are some of those comments that came, actual comments that came on those comment cards. Here's the first one. Trails need to be wider so people can walk while holding hands. How romantic. Here's another one. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Sounds reasonable, right? Here's another one. Too many bugs and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the areas of these bugs. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. Here's another one. A small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there a way I can get reimbursed? That is a bad deal. Get it? Bad deal. All right. Here's another one. Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. That makes sense. A McDonald's would be nice on the trailhead. And finally, there are too many rocks in the mountains. These are actual complaints that came in. That doesn't surprise me at all. You see, life in the wilderness can be difficult. It's not meant to be comfortable. It's not a place we want to go and stay very long. But here's the truth. Sometimes we need a detour to the wilderness. Sometimes we need to go to the wilderness because God needs us to see some things. 
Sometimes we need to open our eyes, and it takes major disruption for us to open our eyes and see what God wants us to see, to see the sin in our lives, to see the pride, the doubt, to see some of the same things that the Israelites needed to see, but probably also to see some other things. You see, sometimes we need to go to the wilderness. We need to experience discomfort. We need to be placed out of our routines, out of our ruts, so that we can open our eyes, so we can address some things that need to be addressed in our hearts and in our lives. And so maybe this current crisis we're in with the pandemic, maybe it is a great opportunity to reevaluate, to look in the mirror, to say, what does God want me to see right now? And to be brutally honest with ourselves. Is there sin in our life? Is there doubt? Do we have priorities that need to be realigned? I know for many people, I've heard them say, you know, I've enjoyed spending more time with family. And it's almost like for many of us, the light bulb went off. You know, the things that I think are so important, yes, some of them are needed, some of them are necessary, some of them are even important, but maybe not as important as some other things or some other people. But there's all kinds of disruptions in life, not just our current COVID crisis. Maybe a major disruption for you has been the abrupt ending of a relationship. And maybe in that moment, as you go into the wilderness for a while, maybe you can open your eyes and look in the mirror and say, you know, what could I, what should I have done differently? In this relationship, am I demonstrating the heart of Christ to this person or these people? Maybe your disruption is a call from the doctor or a health report or a diagnosis, and it's just turned your world upside down, and you're going to have to deal with it. And it may not be easy, but maybe in that moment and in those moments and in the days to come, you can use that as an opportunity to see what God needs you to see, what he wants you to see about your life, about your values, about your priorities, about your plans. Maybe being confronted about your sin is not what you planned, it's not what you want, but maybe it's what you need. Maybe it's what we need so that you can see what is truly happening, so that you can see what God is seeing. You know, when I began to plan this sermon, it was not necessarily going to be about racism. Uh, Maybe it should have been. And maybe God is using current events in our world to to put us in the wilderness as a society, as a church maybe, as individuals, for us to spend some time in the wilderness so that our eyes can be open to what is really happening around us. You know, the events that happen in Minneapolis and Georgia and other places, and the videos that we see, and the the outrage and, and just all of the injustice, all of that. For many people, that has disrupted their lives. It's disrupted their routines. It's disrupted their social media timelines or their TV viewing evenings. You see, but for some people of color, disruption is the routine. You see, every day, their lives could be turned upside down or even threatened simply because of the color of their skin. Some might say, well, We shouldn't really be talking about political things or social issues at church. And let me just say, racism is primarily a spiritual issue. And we should never package it in politics or reduce it to simply a social issue. People, all people, are near to the heart of God. And God actively works in our world to get rid of injustice, to fight against the mistreatment of his image bearers in this world, And as his ambassadors, we must do the same. So maybe God is using these current events to open our eyes, to put us into the wilderness for a bit. Maybe God is sending us there as a a society, as a church, as individuals. And maybe we need to see, maybe we need to see the many ways that our pride and our fear and our lust for power those things are breaking the heart of God and misrepresenting the kingdom of God. You know, if if I am more outraged because someone asked me to wear a mask or I'm more outraged because someone around me isn't wearing a mask during this pandemic than I am 
about what happened in Minneapolis when a man's life was taken, then maybe I'm not ready to come out of the wilderness. Maybe I need to spend some more time there. You see, until we acknowledge the sin and the struggle in our lives, we won't experience the future, the inheritance, the promised land that God has in store for us. We will miss out. Our wilderness experience will just be a place where we file meaningless complaints against those in leadership, including God who is leading us. And so let me ask you, what is your wilderness has a, has a roadblock been put in front of you? Have your plans changed? Have your life, has your life been upended? Is your routine different now? Maybe God is sending you to the wilderness. And what would that wilderness be? What would it look like? And more importantly, what do you need to see there? How do you need to respond in the wilderness? Don't waste the wilderness. Don't waste your wilderness experience. Use it to see something you need to see, things that God wants you to see. Are you disobeying God? Are you disobeying God's word in some way? Are you dishonoring God? Are you, like Israel, are you wanting to go back, maybe to the way things were, whatever that is, go back to the way things were, to the good old days. And maybe the place you want to go back is the very place God is trying to deliver you from. What do you need to see? Are you rewriting history to avoid the future that God has in store for you? What sins are you hiding, ignoring, justifying? Listen to what Moses tells the people after they come out of the wilderness. It's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. He says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Maybe, maybe we go to the wilderness. Maybe we are in the wilderness. Maybe soon you will be in the wilderness, but maybe you're there so God can humble you and test you and see your heart and ultimately transform you. I read a story recently about a retired chemist, an experienced hiker named Igor Skerdoff. Isn't that a great last name, Skerdoff? Hey, where is Igor? He's Skerdoff. Well, <laughs> he wanted to go camping with two of his buddies, and so they're camping at this campsite in a national forest in Northern California. They wake up that morning, they pack up their campsite, and they're going to meet at the end of the day, but Igor wants to go on a day hike by himself. And so they part company, and he goes off. But it doesn't take long for him to get lost. He loses his way. A, a small magnet on some of his gear knocks out his compass, and he misidentifies a, a mountain, and so he gets really turned around. He gets lost, and he is literally wandering in the wilderness. Well, daylight gives way to darkness. He's supposed to meet his friends that evening. It's dark. He's exhausted. He lays down to go to sleep outside with only a poncho and his backpack cover and a wool hat to protect him from the 38 degree night. He doesn't sleep well, but he wakes up the next morning very early and he starts back up to try to find his way out of the wilderness. But he is exhausted. He is so tired that he begins to hallucinate. He begins to see things and hear things that aren't really there. He later said that he saw something like a grandmotherly type woman. He said he saw someone else and heard someone else that he assumed was a, a blues musician. <laughs> you see, they weren't really there. And so he was concerned about what he was seeing and hearing. He was concerned about his safety, but he said, I was never really scared. He said, in fact, at one point I looked around and I saw the beautiful flowers and I saw the trees and the mountains and the lake and it was just gorgeous. And he said, you know, I decided this wouldn't be a bad place to die. This wouldn't be a bad place to die. But he didn't die there. When he didn't show up, his friends finally found someone with a radio, and they called authorities who sent in a helicopter and rescue workers, and actually they found Igor pretty quickly and got him to safety. You see, sometimes we have to wander in the wilderness because that's where 
We need to see things God wants us to see. And we need to embrace those wilderness experiences and not waste them. And sometimes the wilderness is a good place to die. To die to self, to die to pride, dying to apathy, dying to all the things that keep us from the inheritance and the life that God has in store for us. This hiker, Igor, said, this wouldn't be a bad place to die. But he didn't actually die. But so many people do. So many people in this world die lost and alone in the wilderness. That doesn't have to be you. You see, God sent Jesus to come find you. He sent Jesus to find you. And once he finds you, he will save you. And so what do you need to see in your wilderness? What is God trying to show you? Jesus will find you, and he will save you. If there's something we can do to encourage you, if we can pray for you, please let us do that. If you'd like to visit, please let us do that by reaching out. Go to our website, edmundchurchofchrist.com. There's a prayer page there. You can fill out a prayer request. We'd be happy to honor your request and pray for you. If you're going to the wilderness this week, open your eyes and see what God wants you to see. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come before you humbled, humbled for all that you do for us every day. 
We thank you for your greatness and activity in each of our lives every single day. Be with our leadership, Lord. Give them wisdom as they make decisions and plans in this time. Be with this broken world, Lord. Give us healing, but also give us strength to grow through these dark times and to become more like you each and every day. We thank you so much for your son and his incredible sacrifice for each and every one of us. Forgive us when we fall short and help us to glorify you in all that we do. It's in your sons of it I pray. Amen. Hello, church family. I want to give one more plug for that prayer page. That can be found on the home page of our website. And go there and share what's on your heart. Our family wants to pray alongside you. So whatever it is that's going on in your life, whether you want to celebrate or you're going through a tough time, we'll commit to pray alongside you. Share that there, and we will uh, we'll look and pray for those concerns. We do want to extend our sympathy to those who have experienced loss recently. We extend our sympathy to Josh Dale in the passing of his grandfather and to Roy Risley in the death of his brother, who was also the uncle of Kent Risley and family. For our summer of service, the children's ministry has a, uh, has a unique mission for you. And that mission is called Mission Possible. Each week, families can come pick up a mission packet at the North Overhang. That will be on Sundays from noon to 4 p.m. And that program begins today. Those mission packets are going to help us think about how to serve others around us. They'll include a time of study of God's word, a time of prayer, and an object lesson to think about God's word and God's mission in the world. Your family will be blessed if you participate in that. We have a picture here of our brothers and sisters worshiping alongside us at Teal Ridge. It's such a good reminder, and I've been trying to remind us throughout uh, that even though we are apart, we are still worshiping together. We're still one congregation worshiping the Lord together. And I'm thankful for those at Teal Ridge who are worshiping alongside us today. We do have a plan in place to bring us back together, though. We are excited to let you know that on June 7th, next week, our plan is to meet together for worship in the building. We are planning a phased return to the building, so we'll start off with worship only, and then we'll keep our Bible classes online until we move to that next phase. We do want you to know what to expect when you return to the building, so we've made this video to set expectations. Hello, Edmund Church family. Here I am inside the church building. As you can see behind me, there are dozens and dozens of pews that have been taken out of the auditorium so that we can get that space ready for worship. What a great opportunity this has been for us to use this time to renovate, to get new carpet, to do cleaning, and to get everything ready for us to come back together to worship. And we are looking forward to being back together in the building, worshiping together soon. So this video is about some of the things that you can expect when you return to this place for worship. Let me start by saying, Thank you so much for your response to our congregational survey. Over 360 households of over a thousand people are represented on that survey and your responses. So thank you. Thank you for your feedback, your ideas, your concerns, your comments. You are being heard and we're using all of that feedback to inform how we move forward. Of course, we're also using other important things like guidelines from the government and medical advice. In fact, the plan for coming back has been put together and developed by shepherds and ministers and ministry leaders and medical professionals to provide the safest environment possible for us to return to face-to-face -to -face worship together. We are using a phased approach to coming back together, which means we will begin with more restrictions and as we move along, hopefully learn and adapt and eventually loosen some of those restrictions or maybe even remove some of those restrictions. We'll just have to wait and see. Starting out, we will have two Sunday morning worship services and our Bible classes will continue to meet online. And so coming together in these services on Sunday morning will provide an opportunity for some of us to get together physically while others join us online for worship. Although we want badly for everyone to be able to come back together right now for worship in the building. We also want to be smart and wise and show discernment. And so we're going to ask some people to stay home right now and to join us for worship online. We're doing this to help keep everyone as safe as possible and to adhere to government guidelines. 
So if you are sick or someone in your home is sick, or if you've been exposed to a person with COVID-19, please protect others by remaining home and joining us online for worship. If you or someone in your home is part of a vulnerable population, please stay home. And by that, we mean those who are 65 and older and those who have previous medical conditions. Also, if you're taking a prescription medication, you will want to consult your physician to determine if you may be part of a vulnerable population. Of course, an exception to these guidelines applies to those who've already had the virus and have fully recovered. These people are certainly welcome to attend worship in person. Please know that our shepherds will be modeling this behavior and many of them will actually be staying at home as well. We recognize there are a number of different opinions on meeting together right now. And so if for whatever reason you don't feel comfortable coming back to the building and being around other people right now, then please stay home. Worship with us online. You have the leadership's full support to do that. This COVID crisis is an extremely emotional issue for many people. And your opinions and your strong feelings and your emotions may differ from someone else in your church family. But like with all matters, we don't want disagreement to cause disunity. And so if and when you are ready to come back and join your church family in this space to worship, please be patient with each other. Be kind, be considerate. Practice the great command to not only love God, but to love each other as you love yourself. What we're going to ask you to do is to give space and show grace. Give space and show grace to each other. We want to have an environment where everyone feels comfortable worshiping together and where we keep each other safe. In order to create that environment, we expect all attenders to wear a cloth face covering. Please bring your own from home, but if you forget, we'll have one for you. We also ask that you remain six feet apart at all times. Please respect others by refraining from physical greetings like hugs, handshakes, and fist bumps. Choose instead to smile and wave. And please don't be offended if an offer for a hug or a handshake is rejected. We're just trying to keep each other safe. Please wash your hands. Cover your coughs or sneezes. We expect children to stay with their parents at all times. Following guidelines like these show that we care about each other and they also show respect for one another. We're looking forward to you being here on Sunday. We're going to have four entrances open. That will be the north entrance, the new quad kitchen door entrance, the circle drive entrance, as well as the chapel door entrance. We're limiting it to four because we want to be able to effectively and efficiently clean those places between each worship service. Next, we're going to have greeters at each door. They'll open up the door, they'll have on their mask, and they will open up the door to maintain social distancing as the person goes in, and then we will close the door. Once you get inside, there will be masks that you can pick up, as well as hand sanitizer before you go into worship. As you make your way into the foyer, you'll see a couple of stations on tables of communion supplies. They'll have little pieces of bread and individual cups of juice. You'll be able to take your communion during worship and then dispose of your cup inside of those baggies. And then on your way back out into the foyer, there'll be trash cans for you to deposit those. Also on those tables, you'll notice designated boxes where you can give your offering before or after the service. You can also continue to give online if you wish or in the drop box outside of the offices as well. After getting your communion, you'll come into the auditorium and find your seat. You'll notice that certain pews have been blocked off to help you maintain social distance. We ask that families and individuals keep six feet apart. After we're dismissed, please remember to maintain social distance then as well. Singing praises is also a vital part of our worship, but it may be a potentially higher risk activity, so we'll be asked to sing loud through our masks. Additional space will be available with a live feed of the service in case the auditorium reaches capacity or if you would feel more comfortable worshiping there. As most of you know, our Bible classes will continue online as we've been doing. This also means our children's classes, Bible hour, nursery, and toddle time will not be meeting for a while longer. You'll also notice certain areas in the building have been blocked off to help with quick and efficient cleaning between services. We're enthusiastically looking forward to some of us to be able to meet together again. But once again, we would like to reiterate, if what is needed for you to maintain your health and safety, or for those who are members of your home, we understand that you would not be able to be with us right away. We know that it is difficult to be away from your church family. We understand and we are committed 
to providing the best worship experience that you can have online while you join with us from your home. We understand and appreciate the very difficult decision that you have to make on whether or not you should be at the building. Paul encourages us to maintain the spirit of unity along with the bonds of peace. And we appreciate everyone's desire to maintain peace and unity in our church family. If you have a special need, please reach out to one of your elders, contact your Bible class leaders, call the church office. God loves you and we love you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. It is exciting that we're going to be meeting together soon and we are eagerly looking forward to it. But we do know many of you will not be able to join us. So we want you to know we are gonna to continue to stream service and we expect many of you to join us in that way. We will remain one congregation throughout this process. We will be sending out more information through an email and you can also see more details in our bulletin. Above all, we would ask that you continue to keep a spirit of unity with your brothers and sisters, both at the building and at home. That's all of our announcements. I hope you have a blessed week. May God bless our efforts to be disciples and make disciples.